Okay, we're back. Uh, this week we're going to assign a couple uh, check-ins. For AP Physics C, this is going to be your first check-in. Um, some may not have seen these questions yet, so if you want, you can just take a look at the question on the sheet, pause, make some ideas, and then come back to it. Um, so the first question had to do with uh, an electroscope. kind of did this last year in the lab, but it's called charging by induction. I'm going to try to charge this electroscope by induction. Um, four-step process, and I wanted you to walk through what the four steps were and what happens in terms of the electron flow in each of these cases. So what we have here is a negatively charged rod brought near the electroscope in A. In B, you ground it. C, you take the ground away. In D, you take the rod away. Okay. In A, it's going to be one of those situations where the electrons in the knob of the electroscope are probably going to want to go down. So the, electros the uh, charges on the electroscope probably want to migrate downward. They're probably going to polarize at the top more negatives on the right, more positives on the left, but some of the charges are going to repel down to the bottom of the electroscope. So that's charge polarization. In the second step, we've got the grounding mechanism. The grounding mechanism, you touch the electroscope, it's going to want to allow charges to flow either through the ground to the electroscope or from the electroscope to the ground. Does it make sense the electrons are going to want to go to the ground in this case because they're repelled by this negative charge. Even though there's more positives as it grounds, I think that's going to leave more positive on that. There's still some negatives here, but there's definitely going to be more positive throughout. As you take that ground away, you're going to trap in more positives on both the leaves and the knob. Once you take the rod away, then it's going to reorient itself. So I think there's going to be then positives more throughout both the leaves and the knob. So that's a four step process whereby you start with a negative and you end up with a positive net positive charge on the electroscope. So that's called charging by induction. Second question. You have three charges in a line. You have a negative charge in the middle, it says, of 30 millicoulombs. And then you have two charges of both 45 millicoulombs on each end, one being positive and the other being negative. Both sets of 45 millicoulombs are the same distance away from the middle charge. And you want to know something about what's happening with the charge in the middle. And one student says... It is true that the net force in the middle charge is zero, and the question is, does that seem reasonable or not? Well, what you need to do sometimes with Coulomb's Law, you do have that F is K Q1 Q2 over the distance squared, but the question is, do you always put in the negatives or positives? And the answer is, I tell my students, go ahead and draw yourself a free body diagram, if you will. You know that this positive on the left, if you're not looking at what's happening here, if you just cover that, then the negative is going to be pulled to the left. Then if you look at what just the, this negative is going to do to the other negative, it's going to push that to the left. Probably the same amount of charge. I, I don't think I'm showing it right in terms of the length of the arrows of the vectors. But you have two forces all are both being pushed to the left. So I would say that the answer to that question is no, they're not gonna, there's no chance for that to be a net force of zero. It's not reasonable because those two forces happen to be in the same direction. So that was the purpose of that question. Third one, this has to do with taking a look at um, different sets of charges by Coulomb's law and seeing what happens. So I came up with a situation where I had two charged objects a distance apart, Q1 and Q2, but they're given that Q1 is just some number Q, and Q2 is that same number Q. R is some number that you don't know, 
but this setup is giving you such that the net force on that object is 100 newtons. So that's the original case. Now all the different setups from here are related to this. Okay, so we may in fact have to bring this initial setup back for a second. But if that's the case and you had Q and Q that were a distance R apart and there was a force of 100, let's see what happens if you change this up. Let's say Q1 is now 10Q and Q2 is 20 times Q and they're still the same distance R apart. What's the force? Well, remember that Coulomb's Law again, we said that on one of the other pages, is Q1 times Q2 times the constant K over R squared. If we look at just proportions, the first charge is 10 times as much, and the second charge is 20 times as much, and the distance stays the same. So effectively, that's a 1. So wouldn't it be true that your force, which was 100 newtons, is now 20 times 100, which is 20,000 newtons? So I think that's the answer to letter A, is you get a force of 20,000 newtons just by knowing what happened in the first case. Okay, let's go ahead and try this setup. How about if Q1 is 2Q, 2Q2 is also 2Q, but now they're a distance of three times R apart. Again, it's Q1, Q2 over R squared. Let's take a look at the, the proportions. Q1 goes up by a factor of two. Q2 also goes up by a factor of two. But the distance is now 3 squared, 3 times as much. So isn't that a 4 ninths times the original force? So I think the answer should be 4 ninths of 100 newtons. So if you got 400 over 9, I believe that's your answer. Okay, hope that makes sense. The last one puts a couple two pieces together. It's got Q1 is 10Q, Q2 is negative 4Q, so now you have a negative charge. And what you're going to do is touch both of the spheres, separate them to the same distance, and then ask what is the new force. So we want to pause and try that. 10Q, negative 4Q, and split. Now the idea of charge sharing, when they touch and they separate, they should have some neutralization of force. 10 and negative 4 gives you a total of 6Q. I think there's going to be 3Q on each one. And they're still that same distance of one apart. So to me, that means that the force is now going to be 9 times as much, or 900 newtons. See if that one makes sense. Hopefully it does. And now we're going to go on to the last question. So let me pose this question to you and then we'll quick go through it. Um, you've got a Gauss's Law type problem where you have a set of spherical shells. You've got an inside conductor that has a charge of plus Q on it at radius A. Then you have a non-conductor in the middle. You've got a conducting shell inner radius B, outer radius C, and you're asked what happens if the total amount of charge on the conducting shell is 4Q, then try to figure out what is the charge on the inner side? What is the charge on the outer side? What are the electric field strengths in the region non-conducting and then outside R equals C? And then what is the surface charge density for that? So take a second, pause, and see if you can come up with some answers and then we'll come back okay we're back the inner amount on there I'm gonna say that it always induces a charge that's opposite to what's on the on the inner sphere and so that would be minus Q if that's the case and the total amount of charge on this shell is plus 4q wouldn't it make sense that the outer one to get plus 4q would have to be plus 5 because when you add those two together you get plus 4. 
How about thinking about, you could look through uh, Gauss's law and try to find the answer to this, but would it not be true that the electric field is probably going to be Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared if you go in the middle region, the Q enclosed is plus 4Q. So Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R squared. If it's outside, then the total Q is 5Q, and then it would still be 4 pi epsilon naught R squared if you use Gauss's law. Hopefully those are making sense to you. The last thing is just to remind you, what do we mean by surface charge density? Surface charge density is charge over area. In this case, on the outer shell, the charge is 5Q. The surface area would be 4 pi r squared, but is it not at radius C? So I think our answer is probably 5Q over 4 pi C squared should be our answer. I hope that was reasonable for you as we went through it. Uh, and I guess we'll wait till we have the next check-in. If you have any questions, let me know. Thank you. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.